Um, all right, cool. So today we are talking about something that I don't often talk about, but I did talk about it at our mastermind retreat um, the other week. And uh, I thought it's worth sharing here. And it is um, all about the artful or creative side of writing copy. This is something that I never, ever, ever, ever talk about because it's where people jump in the first place. So um, it feels like, okay, the world already thinks that copy is supposed to be this creative thing. We haven't seen evidence that it's supposed to be all creative at all, at all. Um, so I don't want today's session to shake you away from what we otherwise talk about with conversion copywriting. And if you're like, I don't even know what conversion copywriting is, then you should go, interesting Todd, then you should um, go over to copyhackers.com and look at our tutorials and our blogs, uh, our blog posts all about um, what conversion copywriting is all about, which is really process based, right? It's like grounded in the idea that you can be as um, strategic and thoughtful and um, intentional with everything that you do in writing copy that converts. So we're not ever going to start by looking at how to be creative with our copy and let's start with voice or anything like that. That's not what a conversion copywriter would do. That's not what we talk about at Copy Hackers. But there comes a moment, usually one or two moments, when you're writing copy where creativity or artfulness goes a long way. These are moments, <laughs> just moments. So I don't want, one, I don't want the takeaway here to be like, oh, Joanna said I should always be creative. Nope, that's not what I'm gonna say today, but there are times when you'll need to be when you're writing copy. And in particular, we're gonna talk about when you're writing web copy today, um, where you want to, I like to say you wanna give people chills. And that usually means give your client a little bit of a chill, like, ooh, that was well said. Um, so you wanna look for those moments, but that's not your goal throughout uh, what you're writing. So I'm going to share with you a snippet of the presentation that was exclusively for people in my mastermind. Um, you're going to get that today. So I'm going to start sharing my screen just to be really clear. We are recording this. Replays are available a couple weeks after the live recording. So well done being here. Um, let me minimize this. Then comes art. So after all of the science stuff, all of the process, everything we're always talking about, then we think about um, how to be artful. And now um, here's a line that I like to share and think about when I'm thinking about moments when data-driven companies with really great copy um, branch out and make us feel things. So, right, so we've all been kind of, you can, it might be hard for you some of this, because some of this is a little unclear, and the point is not to read every word or anything, but to know that when we're writing copy, we have to get inside our customers' heads, and using their um, voice will do that. We also want to get inside their hearts, too, right? We want to make them feel something, like really feel something, um, and that's where sometimes Voice of customer data will still do that too, especially when you're agitating the way they're feeling or agitating the way they want to feel. And agitation always sounds negative. You can agitate the way they want to feel in really positive ways too. Um, but there's also the artistry behind what we do. And this is where if you are somebody who writes creatively and you've been like, you know what, I think I can do this copywriting thing, and then we've tried to like beat you down with all of the no, don't be creative stuff on copywriting. This is where there will be moments where your creativity or your natural writing talents can shine. Um, so we're going to talk about where exactly that is, but I want to be clear that we're always thinking long term, right? We want to convert our clients, visitors into customers. We want to get their um, their users continuing to use the product, so retention, get referrals in, generate revenue, all of that great stuff. We have lots of things that we want to do um, that are all about our clients, customers, or our own customers. Um, but there is immediate power 
in giving your client the chills or when you are the chills or when you're sitting around a boardroom table and you're presenting copy if you're in-house. So for the marketing team to look at your copy and you're like, erg, when you can make the people in the room feel something, um, in addition to all of the great research that shaped your copy, when you can make them feel something, there is incredible power in that. And I don't just mean power for the sake of power. I mean, there's incredible power that will get more people to buy into the possibility that your copy is the greatest copy they've ever read and they're so excited they hired you. Okay, but how? How do we do that? How do you make things sound really, really good? I'm going to go through a couple things that I do. Um, one day I might dive a little deeper into some of these, but first things first, you want to have creative inspiration everywhere everywhere when you're writing. So again, if you're following the conversion copywriting process of research and discovery, writing, wireframing, and editing, and then testing validation, you're already going to be really grounded in data. Everything you're doing is like, here's the framework, here's where voice of customer data pushes into that framework, and then we edit in the awesome. Um, that's all very processy. Then comes this artful, artful side of it where you want to have access to things that make you feel creative to kind of balance out, um, not balance fully, but temper all of the, the science as we call it. So for me, I have this book called Snow White, which is actually downstairs right now, but it's usually right here. This is the first book I ever read that made me go, holy crap, like language can do really cool stuff. The English writing can be so cool um, after having been you know raised on Mark Twain which genius of course we're not going to get into that but seeing someone write so differently about something that's so standard like the story of Snow White anybody who took you know who was an English major who did postmodern literature at any point interested in deconstruction that kind of stuff which I loved in undergrad um, has probably read this and you might be like, oh, I know that. And if you haven't, I'm not saying read this exact book, although it won't hurt. Um, but have something that is creatively like challenging near you. And for some people that might be, you have really beautiful um, artwork that when you look at it on the wall next to your desk and you let yourself just look at it, you, you're, your brain starts shifting a little bit, right? Like we know anybody who's been moved by creativity knows what that feels like. Um, and that's what we're really looking for is just to keep something that inspires you near you so that when you're like going through voice of customer data and thinking of the right framework to use and you're putting it all together, you can look up and remember that there's still a little art to what you do and that when it comes down to it, you're going to want to say things differently. You're going to want to show things differently. Um, and that's where having those creative inspiration pieces around can help. So whatever book, if you think through like, Oh yeah, that was the first book where I ever really felt that writing could be X grab that book, keep it next to you. It's not like anything in snow white has ever actually directly impacted what I wrote when it comes to copy. Um, but it's helped me break out of, kind of, I don't want to say a rut because it's not even a rut. You don't have to be in a rut for that, but it's helped me break out of my own head and the, the data that we're going through. Um, another thing that's a really clear and obvious thing to do, and we don't often talk about it, but we should all kind of be doing it, is have the websites handy of like open next to your, so you have your copy doc. This is how I write. I have my copy doc off in one side, whether it's a Google doc, air story doc or word. And I frankly do switch between all of them based on how I feel. I don't know. Um, but you have that open on one side, your copy doc open on one side and a website with copy that inspires you open on the other. And sometimes it's like copy that inspires you to be a really great copywriter. And other times it's like, oh, my client really loves these, the copy on this website. So I'm gonna have that open. And that's as, let's like constantly having a tutorial going next to you where you're like, oh, what did Apple do there? And you look through it and you read through it, read through the, the page again and again, and get a feel for the places where um, the copy seems to come to life and where it pulls back and things like that. Uh, having cliches handy is actually going to be really helpful when it comes to the part that I'm going to show you about where you can get creative in your copy. Um, ProWritingAid.com, that's pro writing aid, A-I-D, dot com um, has this giant list of cliches 
Tragically, they're alphabetical, but you can still search through them um, to find like any sorts of things. And we'll get into how you'll use this, but having ways that people speak handy that you can play with um, is a really good thing too. And of course, also having other things like great quotes handy can go a long way. So the top 100 quotes of all time, whatever that might be. Um, so we want to have really creative fiction handy, have your client's favorite copy handy, have uh, quotes, euphemisms, cliches, other things people um, say, like just the way people speak handy. Um, you also want to audit the words that non-competitive businesses serving that market that you're writing for use. So I was writing recently for a um, really high-end mattress. And when I was writing for them, I was like, okay, well, how do you describe, how do people who are selling really expensive products to people who are willing to pay really good money for the best household items, how do they describe that product? Voice of customer data will get you far, but matching or exceeding um, expectations of your market regarding how things should be should be talked about goes a long way too. So in selling a high-end mattress, I went and looked at other high-end um, products that are completely unrelated, like a wolf range. So a lot of people who aspire to have a beautiful mattress where they're like, oh my gosh, I'm so glad we spent money on this, um, also aspire to have other beautiful things in their home that some people would think are outrageous to spend money on, like seven or $8,000 on a wolf range, but go over to that space. And so when I was writing, I went to the wolf website and looked at how they describe it. You would think that you need to get really fluffy and like, Ooh, make it sound like luxurious and actually say the word luxury. But in the case of like wolf range and other high end products, when you look through that for like the ways to get, you know, people feeling things, a lot of it was just getting down to really uh, descriptive uses like uh, talking through actual product materials in scientific sounding ways. So that's another way to kind of get in and start feeling um, the space that you're going to be writing in instead of just looking at voice of customer data. Study writing books, not just copywriting books. So Sarah years ago bought me um, a book called Bird by Bird. I'm sure a lot of people who write um, have read that book. Other writing books, books about writing will take you a long way when it comes to writing copy. They won't take you all the way at all. <laughs> They'll hurt you sometimes. Um, but we want to, again, I'll focus you on where you're going to use writerly techniques. And then read and rewrite as much fiction as you do copy. So you might be somebody who writes a lot of, who's heard that if you have a swipe file um, or a really great sales page that you found that you love, you should go through and rewrite that by hand three times. That's a pretty common thing um, for people who are learning to be copywriters. I say do the same thing with fiction though, to get a sense for how really great stories and arguments are pulled together and how people feel <laughs> when it comes down to it. So um, if you wanted to learn to write like JK Rowling, you could rewrite Harry Potter every year for the rest of, for the next 10 years. And you'd probably end up having more of that like muscle memory when it comes to actually writing creative sorts of things. So I recommend that you read and rewrite as much fiction as you do copy. Okay. Now that's like some background on how to get creative when you're still thinking conversion copywriting. Now let's get into where you're going to use these techniques. You are only, only going to be writerly in your headlines and your crossheads. For those who are like, what's a crosshead? A crosshead is a headline. People call it a subhead often. Um, a crosshead is really a headline that's down the page. So it's a crosshead. So it's going to go across um, the page as you go down the page. So you might call it a subhead. Start calling it a crosshead. It's more copywriterly to call it that. So headlines and crossheads only. That's where you're going to be writerly. Not in body copy, not in other like the spaces where people need to read to acquire um, information and have their awareness brought up a notch or two or three um, or where you're trying to sophisticate your reader. Okay, so how do you do that? Really, if you are a person who loves writing, this will already sit really well with you. So you wanna use uh, writing techniques like parallelism and antithesis. Um, so for example, let me just get into it. 
we, again, this is a 20 minute tutorial, so I won't walk you through every possible rhetorical device you could be using, but look up rhetorical devices and keep that open in another tab as well if you are writing and you're going through your headlines and crossheads to make them sound better. So when we look at this, this is like parallelism. Dream it up, jot it down. Um, this is only used in um, the headline or crosshead here we can see. So when you go through, you can read that the body copy below, and I, again, I encourage you actually, Apple has incredible copy, not just, they don't take it easy just because they can, like they could call it in. If anybody on the planet could call it in, it's Apple, and they don't, it's important. So, um, but when you read through the body versus the headlines and crossheads, you'll see that they save anything that feels like a writer wrote it, for headlines and crossheads. When it comes to the body copy, it still sounds well written, but it's not trying to be noticed. It's trying to express the benefits and all the other things that a copywriter would do um, in their body copy. So dream it up, jot it down, that's parallelism. Um, you'll wanna stay in bed each morning, but you'll be ready to get up as kind of this antithesis sort of thing, still set up with this parallel idea. Um, iPad, another one here, I'm gonna use a lot of Apple examples because so good like a computer, unlike any computer. I mean, you write that in a crosshead, and what does your client think? Like, well done us for hiring this person, that's awesome. And you completely can do it if you focus your attention on headlines and crossheads, especially when you're writing websites, to make them sound really good, then you can do that. You don't have to start there, and you shouldn't start there. This should be something that you do during your um, uh, sweep process when you're actually going back through and editing in the awesome, but you want to focus headlines and crossheads on that. Um, another technique is sort of word swapping. So let me explain what that is. Now, Mercedes is coming out with an electric car. Okay. This is the headline that we see after we see a different headline. It starts with one headline and then it switches over to this one on the page. So if you were told to write copy a headline that expresses something that'll um, give people a little bit of chills when it comes to um, understanding what this car is all about. So you hear from the client, okay, Mercedes now has an electric car. Um, we're gonna write copy about Mercedes now having an electric car. Some people might jump to something like just jumping right into what, the, what it is but a more writerly approach is to do something more like this. This was their actual headline when you first land on the page, electric now has a Mercedes. And you know, everybody in the room when they saw that was like, whoa, and that's what we want. That's the like feeling that you wanna give people. Mercedes has an electric, but that's not the point. So they just swap those words around. You can't do it all the time. But when we're talking about things like shaping new categories or being really innovative, you can use that sort of technique in your headlines. Reworking cliches, quotes, and euphemisms. So I already told you to keep those sorts of uh, websites open when you're writing copy. And again, headlines and crossheads only. Um, things like welcome to the big screens instead of like to the big screen, right? Just a little play on words. We're allowed to use plays on words. Yep. Um, in our headlines and crossheads, okay? Run a mile in her shoes. Uh, stronger than fiction instead of stranger than fiction for like a voting, um, uh, things like that, right? So we're taking an existing way that people, something people already know and have memorized that's kind of baked into the way, at least in this case, English speakers talk and tapping into that as a writerly sort of thing to do. Um, and then sometimes you don't even have to switch anything around. You can just use a quote or cliche or euphemism, but put it in a new um, context, like, step into the light, something like that. This might not be the greatest, most writerly um, headline, but we can see what's happening here. The headline is step into the light, and then below it, the body copy is really clear. This is what an electric vehicle looks like as Mercedes. The clear surfaces, the minimal contours, and the organic forms create a unique aesthetic. There's nothing writerly about that. No one's being super creative there, but it's clear, it's really good copy, and frankly, it's also really good writing when it comes down to it. Rhyme lightly, okay? So that is something like all new for a better you. Don't go overboard with rhyming. If you're going to rhyme at all on a website, are in your copy, do it one time. And I mean, if you're writing a big old website, do it one time in one headline or one crosshead. 
don't go overboard. Your client, if they see it more than once, will be like, we're seeing a lot of that like technique. <laughs> so don't overdo it. Play that card one time and one time only. Okay, so those are some ways that you can start being a little more artful with the copy that you write. Again, where does it happen? Only in your headlines and crossheads. Now others might say, oh, I've seen it in body copy too. Great. Don't start there. Don't do that first. Headlines and crossheads, do that for the next five years. And then after that five year period is up, then you can start exploring other places to be um, quote unquote write, writerly or artful. So you want to sell the science to your clients. You want to also deliver art that's based on science and on art. Remember, of course, everyone thinks they can do your job as a copywriter. Your job is definitely proving that they can't, that they cannot, I mean, and that means starting with the conversion copywriting process, knowing that the core of the copy that you've written comes from the voice of the customer and the part that gives them chills comes from you and no one else can repeat what you do. No one else can do it the way you do. We're talking about this now because as we get into November, um, the tutorials in November are going to be all about um, being a better freelance copywriter. So we're starting to talk about that right now because it's a really important thing for people to think about, especially as if you are a freelancer or you're thinking of going freelance, as we get toward the beginning of 2019, that's like when we want to start. Most people are like, okay, what am I going to do in 2019? So November is going to be all about helping you figure out what to do in 2019 to be a better freelancer. But that is today's tutorial for um, writing copy uh, that is more artful. Thanks, Sarah, for manning all of the chat and making everything work. Uh, the replay will be available shortly. Thanks, everybody, for your great participation and questions. And we'll see you next week where we have a special guest. We were supposed to have a special guest come in today. He got sick. We have a different special guest coming in next week, again, to talk about cool stuff for being a freelancer. So uh, we'll see you on our next tutorial Tuesday. Thanks, everybody. Bye.